Uh, thank you. Thanks for the welcome. Uh, so as you can see, uh, today I'm going to narrate the story about how we introduced a code of conduct to a well-established open source community. Uh, I think this is not the first time we are using, the, we are hearing this term code of conduct. So the volunteers here have been emphasizing about the code of conduct for this particular conference uh, quite a few times. Uh, just a quick show of hands, how many of us have taken the time to read the code of conduct that comes with this conference? Yes, I see some hands, which is great. I would uh, really encourage all of us to go and read the code of conduct. Uh, so before I begin trigger warning, uh, we might talk about some intense topics here. So if anyone wants to leave, I would definitely understand. So that, that uh, begs the question, what is a code of conduct? So a code of conduct is a document uh, that outlines the expected behavior for participating in a community. So it uh, serves to establish some guidelines that uh, are nice to have in an open source community, which uh, facilitates the community being open and welcoming to everyone, irrespective of their uh, academic background or their gender or race or anything, which is really the beauty of open source software. Uh, so now again, why do we need a code of conduct? So a code of conduct, uh, the way I see it, serves as a tool to define community standards for participating in a community. It, it is a really important uh, piece of document that uh, signals that a project is really welcoming to anyone who wants to participate. But the more important part of it is that it provides a reporting mechanism for uh, any code of conduct violations. And the uh, crucial part here is that uh, people ought to know where and how they can report any code of conduct violations. It also serves to establish the procedure of handling such violations. Uh, we'll see how. Uh, before uh, I go to the core part of it, uh, this is from a 2017 survey conducted by GitHub. And uh, it reported that 3% uh, of all respondents identified as women and 16% of them identified as ethnic minorities, which is really not great. I think all of us would agree with that. I didn't really dig more into this data because this was already depressing, but I'm sure uh, whatever we dig is probably going to be similar numbers. And uh, the point is we shouldn't stop here. The point is uh, we keep thinking about how to improve these numbers, right? Uh, in open source software, people matter as much as code. Again, that's really the beauty of open source software. Uh, again, another question. Who can ask for inclusion of a code of conduct in a project? Uh, the answer is basically anyone. Uh, it should never be the case that only if you have contributed a lot or if you are a core part of the development that gives you the right to ask for including a code of conduct. Uh, so when I asked this question for the community, I was a contributor, but I was not a significant contributor. But uh, I was still welcome to ask this question. So if you feel like you should ask this question, you should. Uh, so for the rest of this talk, I'm going to narrate uh, the story of adding a code of conduct to a well-established open source community, which is the OCaml programming language community. So uh, OCaml is a ML family uh, functional programming language. So there are more uh, functional programming languages that are derived from the ML family of languages. And ML here stands for meta language, not machine learning. Uh, it was created in 1996 at uh, India, Paris. So OCaml is essentially older than I am. And uh, they are, uh, there's a good uh, user base that's also growing in the recent times from both academia and the industry, uh, which is also spread across the world. There are uh, contributors uh, from France, obviously, which is where it started. There are contributors uh, from the UK. There are contributors from India, some of whom are uh, sitting in this room. And uh, self-plug, we are running a workshop on introduction to OCaml tomorrow. So if you're curious about what it is, I would encourage you to check it out. Uh, so this is not the first time uh, 
the attempt to include a code of conduct uh, to the community happened. So, the first attempt uh, started in 2017 and uh, it was more of a discussion amongst uh, the maintainers on what and how it can be done. Uh, so, the team ended up, uh, the core development team ended up forming a special group for uh, dealing with the code of conduct who went ahead and uh, wrote down a text for the code of conduct. But uh, unfortunately, that is where this stopped uh, and this was not uh, really publicized either. Uh, so, in 2022, uh, like I mentioned earlier, I asked this question to some of the maintainers, so that is, why do we not have a code of conduct for the community, where uh, it's getting increasingly common for uh, bigger open source projects to have a code of conduct. Uh, so, they offered uh, for me to take the initiative to lead this effort. Uh, so, that is when uh, we started working on it again, so this was attempt number two, uh, which again goes on to show that uh, you don't necessarily have to succeed in the first attempt. Uh, so in the second attempt, uh, we formed a team. Uh, it did have some overlap with the team that was formed earlier, but most of it were uh, new people. We proposed adding the code of conduct to all the major uh, communication channels and development channels, namely GitHub. Slack, uh, sorry, not Slack, Discord, the mailing list, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, another cru crucial part of this was seeking community feedback. I'll talk about that uh, in a while. And this also led to some amendments uh, in the whole process. So, which comes to show that uh, this is really an iterative process. Uh, there's no one recipe that would work for everyone. Uh, so, the first part of this was forming an enforcement team. Uh, which brings us to the question, what is a person who's in the code of conduct enforcement team does? So, uh, like the volunteers mentioned here, uh, there's an email, uh, coc at indiafors.org, which you can write to for India First and you can either contact Vishal or Ria. So, uh, for somebody uh, to be in the code of co conduct enforcement te team, what does it really mean? So it means uh, that person is an approachable point of contact for uh, reporting any uncomfortable instances that people might have faced in an open source community. Uh, so they are also responsible for uh, ensuring that uh, they take the right action in the right time when such reports reach them. It, uh, it's also important that uh, the scope of this is well defined and we started with uh, the scope that I've mentioned here as uh, I mentioned earlier as well. So the main uh, scope of this is uh, GitHub projects where uh, most of the development happens and other communication channels that are frequented by the community members and uh, is open to public, which is uh, Discord, Slack, Discourse, mailing lists and uh, other channels that the community uses. Uh, who is a good candidate for uh, being in this team. Uh, so, this should be someone who is willing to do this work because this is uh, non-paid volunteer work and uh, by design it has to be that way because uh, uh, let's say somebody uh, is okay with paying the people in this team, they are essentially in conflict of interest with the team. So, that really cannot happen. Um, it's also useful for that person to have been a part of uh, the open source community for a while so that uh, they have a good understanding of how the community operates and uh, that really helps in gathering context whenever that's needed. It's also nice to have a mix of new contributors and uh, uh, long time contributors so that uh, the team is really balanced in, term of, in terms of uh, the kind of contributors. Uh, I mean it goes without saying that uh, the person by nature is nice and inclusive. Um, it, it's useful to have project maintainers because they will be able to say, take some actions on uh, the communication channels, but this is generally not a hard requirement. Uh, to emphasize uh, again about conflict of interests, to avoid conflict of interests, uh, we didn't include uh, people with significant power or people in uh, prominent hiring positions. Uh, so, the team operates with some bylaws 
which is that uh, it has to be balanced in terms of representation and uh, it has to maintain a size that's roughly proportional to the size of the community so that the team has enough people to share the work and uh, people in the team are not overburdened. Uh, it's also useful to have the team decentralized in terms of organization so that you don't have too many people from the same organization. Uh, as for the text, we can use a text that already exists or write one from scratch. We ended up using one that already exists, which is what I would recommend because uh, there's really no point in rewriting something where uh, something that's been used for a while uh, and you can already use it exists. These are the various stages of action when there's a violation report. Uh, so the team is first going to have a private conversation with uh, the person who was reported to have done a COC violation. Uh, this may escalate to a public conversation if that doesn't work. Uh, for extreme cases, they will be requested to apologize. Uh, for more extreme cases, there's going to be bans, but uh, I hope that it doesn't get to that. Uh, so we went ahead and we proposed to add a code of conduct to all the major uh, communication channels within the community. Um, so a code of conduct can be adopted when the project is created, which is the easiest way. But uh, when a project is created, it's possible that uh, it's really small in terms of the number of people involved. People don't really see the need to add a code of conduct. But that changes when the project gets bigger and you have contributors from outside. So uh, it can also be added at a later point in time. Uh, so the crucial aspect of adopting a code of conduct is that the community needs to be on board with the idea. And uh, legitimate concerns raised by the community should be taken into account in the implementation process. Uh, so I'm quickly going to debunk some of the commonly raised concerns against introducing a code of conduct. So the first one is that uh, a code of conduct explicitly lists protected classes and that uh, has the risk of making in-group people being excluded. Well, that's really not uh, the idea behind explicitly listing uh, protected classes because they are more vulnerable to harassment or other kind of issues within the community. Uh, second thing is that uh, when everything is fine, why do you need a code of conduct? But the point here is that uh, everything is seemingly fine. We really don't know if everything is fine. And uh, that's also not a guarantee that everything will be fine in future. Uh, so uh, the next thing is that the code of conduct is centered around diversity. And that is by design. And that is for good reason, right? Uh, interactions outside community spaces, such as social media, Twitter, Facebook, might be scrutinized. That's generally not the case at all, except for uh, extreme cases like hate messages, etc., where action needs to be taken. Uh, some members may leave the community because they don't really agree with introducing a code of conduct which might be true, but what is also true is that people leave due to harassment or abuse of any form, which is something we should strive to stop. If it means that some people leave because they don't agree with this, I think it's all right. Uh, issues with the text. So one thing we learned uh, throughout this entire process is that, uh, no, no, I mean, we cannot make everyone 100% happy with the text. And the text essentially keeps evolving. So uh, this is not really a huge issue in my opinion. Uh, yeah, this is again a legitimate concern where uh, people in the code of conduct enforcement team might have some power and uh, they might misuse their power. But uh, really the thing is uh, people in the code of conduct enforcement team are held to the same standards as the rest of the community. And uh, people uh, that doesn't shield them from code of conduct violations themselves. So really, uh, they are going to be handled in the same way as any other person in the community. Uh, so like I mentioned, uh, all these questions led to some amendments. And we ended up choosing a different text than the one we proposed in the beginning for various reasons. Uh, and uh, we also ended up making some minor changes to the text. Uh, 
yeah, some takeaways. Uh, what is a COC and uh, I mean, the bottom line is that this is an effort to make the community more inclusive. Uh, I would like to acknowledge uh, all the people who volunteered to be in the Code of Conduct Committee and uh, other people who stood by us throughout this pro process. And uh, with that, uh, I would like to uh, end this by saying that uh, this has been a huge learning process for us. Uh, and if you have other perspectives to this, I would be very happy to hear that. Uh, do we have time to take questions? Uh, yeah, I'd be happy to answer questions here or uh, offline. Yeah. Uh, if there are questions, I'm happy to. Uh, sorry, can you repeat? A, a GCA way to standardize a code of conduct across organizations and projects, or it will always be particular? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. Uh, so, uh, pa the way I see it, the part of the standardization is reusing text. So, contributor covenant is one very popular code of conduct that's been used by a lot of projects. Uh, I think uh, the text part of it can be standardized reasonably well, and that also works well because you have had much more eyes on it than something that you're writing from scratch. But the part that's going to be specific to the community is how you handle conflicts and who is going to handle the conflict. That, I think, has to be decided by the community themselves. And uh, that's, I mean, it can be generalized in the sense that uh, there can be recommendations. But in the end, it's the community that's going to adopt what works for them.